focusing on my behaviors. I'm going to share with you three reasons. A lot of times I was trying to change my life. I was trying to improve to there's things in my life that I was unhappy with. I was sick and tired of doing the same things over and over and I felt trapped and I would try to shift what I'm doing and my behavior but it just wasn't enough and I realized it wasn't working and I, I didn't understand what was going on. So today I'm going to be sharing with you what I found that has helped me to find lasting change without focusing on my behaviors. Number one was understanding the principle of working from the inside out because what I was doing is I, I remember as a child I was, I was just selfish, I was disobedient, I was rebellious, I was not listening to my family or contributing and I didn't want to be like that. My family was upset with me. They, they were tired of me being so selfish and I was pushing away the very people that I wanted to draw closer to me and that didn't feel very good. I, I wanted to express my love, but it just it wasn't working very well. So I tried to change my behavior. I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a I'm gonna contribute more to my family. I'm going to help uh, take out the trash. I'm gonna wash the dishes. I'm gonna be consistent in doing what is of, expected of me. And as I tried to do that, it was just it wasn't. I would just fall back to making the same mistake. And then when I make a mistake or just kind of prioritize video games over over the trash or something then I would just beat myself up and be like oh I messed up I failed and then my family would see uh, especially my sister she'd be like you know it's like yeah you're always the same way you're never gonna change and, and uh, you're, you're the same old Enoch and and I and it, and it really bothered me and it's like yeah you're right you're right I am the same Enoch and I did mess up and then it discouraged me from like even having that goal to to be a different person and it was really difficult until I read Matthew thirteen thirty three. Jesus describes how the kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven and how that analogy of leaven which is yeast it's like how you put yeast into a loaf of bread and at first you have the dough and it's flat but the yeast in there it rises the dough and it makes it grow and, and it raises and it works from the inside out but a lot of times what we try to do is work from the outside in what do I mean by that we try to focus on the outward actions and the behaviors to make the change but God is saying, no, my kingdom works from the inside. He wants to start with the heart. And when the heart is won, when the heart is prepared, the motives are shifted, then the actions, the behaviors will be a, a, a result of a renewed heart. And once I understood that, it's like a light bulb turned on. I was like, whoa, this Jesus went into further detail in, in Matthew chapter 23 verse 26. He was describing how he's saying, Woe unto you scribes and, and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like a cup that is washed on the outside and is dirty on the inside. And that analogy spoke to me because it's like, think about it. Have you ever been like walked in your kitchen and you open the cupboard and you grab your favorite glass and you're going to drink something out of it? And you see on the outside, it's just clean and shiny, it's all nice, but on the inside you see some like caked in dirt or, or food and you're just like, or maybe some like slime at the bottom and you're like, ugh. Now, how good is that glass for you to drink? Does that make you want to use it? Absolutely not. There's no point in washing the outside if the inside is still filthy. And that's what Jesus is trying to show to all of us and that's what he was trying to show to me is that me focusing so much on my behavior and changing my ways and doing something different, all of these things are useless if my motive, if my heart is not in the right place. But when God is able to clean my heart, then the, the, the behavior starts to come with it. I remember... Um, I remember, I, I just read something from C.S. Lewis last night that it was saying on a friend's story that 
Um, obedience is not legalism. It's uh, obedience is a symptom of salvation. So it's a symptom where we think that the actions is the cause, is the root of the problem, but it's not. If we're doing the wrong things, that's really just a symptom that is showing that the, the, the cause is that our heart is not one. It's not subdued. We are not surrendering to Christ. And I realized that in my, in my heart, I wanted, when I was trying to change for my family, I wanted to be different so they can see that I'm a different person. I wanted to change my behavior because I was tired of the pain. I, I wanted to avoid the consequence of living so selfishly. It wasn't because I, I, I really, I, I loved Christ and I see that He wanted something new for me. He wanted me to live a new life. And it wasn't because of this great gratitude that I had for my family and I just naturally wanted to give back what they have given to me. It was a selfish motive. And so that wasn't enough to push me through those challenges. A lot of times in our change, we, it, it's like a, an orchard. You have a fruit tree, and you see that the tree has, the, the fruit is, is rotten, or the leaves have boils and, and sores, and, and you see that the leaves are just are sickly and diseased, and you're realizing, wow, this tree that should be bearing good fruit is, is sickly. So then you start going to work on cutting off all the leaves and you're trying to cut, cut these leaves and, leaves and change the leaves in order to make them better. But it doesn't matter how much you change the leaves and, and deal with the fruit, that that's not the issue. The fruit is a symptom. So when you give the soil the nutrients that it needs, when you dung up the tree, when you provide it th what it needs, then it will change from the inside. It pulls from that nutrition and it gets that from the soil. And then the fruit is going to be a good fruit and it's going to produce more abundantly. But the fruit is like in Hebrews chapter 12, 11, it describes the fruit of righteousness. Fruit is a symbol of our actions. It's our behaviors. So often we're trying to fix the, the fruit, the behavior, but we don't realize it's the soil. And in Matthew 13, Jesus describes that the soil is a symbol of the condition of the heart. As a sower that went forth to sow, and it fell on the four different types of soil, and he said each one of them were those who received the seed, which was the word of God, into the heart. So the soil gives us the nutrients. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Word of God is our soul's nourishment. This is what we are to be feasting on. The, the bread of life and the water of life. When we drink of this water, Jesus promised we'll never thirst again. This is what satisfies the longing of the heart. This is what quenches the soul's thirst after righteousness. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Matthew 6, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God is ready to satisfy your heart. He's ready to satisfy mine. And this is, but He wants us to change our focus. My focus was on my behavior. And as long as I was focusing on what I was doing, I wasn't getting lasting change. But it was as soon as I shifted to why I was doing it, that's when everything made the difference because then I it, it wasn't until I realized that God loved me so much as Jeremiah 31 says he has loved me with an everlasting love and with loving kindness he drew me and I realized that I was the I was the worst that I've ever been and I would just hit rock bottom I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and I was just like this is the worst I've ever been and I thought when was I the happiest and it's like it was when I was on fire for Christ and I was like wait a second you mean to tell me I had the most joy, the most peace, the most happiness when I was on fire for Christ? Because how I'm living right now is totally different than that. But I, I just remember hearing that God's a God of love. And I figured if God really is a God of love, He must always want me to have that. And I was seeing like, how can I have that walk with you, that experience, that it doesn't fade away as it did before. 
And I was just praying, Lord, return unto me the joy of thy salvation. Renew a right spirit within me. I want to be with you. I want to be like you. And he was showing me that he sent it, he exhausted heaven's resources in giving me a son. He loved me so much and he filled this void. I really believe that all of us have this God-shaped hole in our heart that only God's love can fill. And without God's love reigning in our heart, we try to fill it with so many of these different distractions, whether it's video games or relationships or food or all of these things I was struggling with. It, it's just, and, and maybe those aren't the things that you struggle with, but there are things, anything that we put above God or that we allow us to do, even though our conscience is saying, don't do it, it's screaming, don't do it, and we do it anyways, that becomes an idol in our life. And these are the things that we're trying to fill. We think that this pleasure and this joy is going to come from these things, but we don't realize the sadness is that these are the very things that are causing us the pain and the misery in life. So the sooner we can get sin out of our lives, the better our lives can get. But the only way that sin will be removed is when God's love is reigning in the heart and He satisfies us and we don't have need of those other pleasures that are only temporary. They're pleasures for a short season. When we put our happiness in temporary things, our happiness will be temporary. So put, set your affections on things above, on things that are eternal, and God, God is going to satisfy those. So that's when, that was one of the concepts. The second concept that I learned is that we can do the exact same thing for a different motive, and God is actually looking. He's looking deeper. Ecclesiastes 3, 17 describes how God is going to bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So he's looking at the secrets. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, Jesus said, The word of God is quick, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder the soul and spirit, the bone dividing asunder the bone and marrow, and searching the very thoughts and intents of the heart. God is looking at our intentions. He is looking at our motives. He is looking at the deep recesses of our minds. And God is not only looking at what you're doing, He's looking at why you're doing it. So this, this, could, be, this could go two ways. And this was a big aha moment that I had, is that I could be doing much good. I could be doing a lot of good things. I could be helping others. I could be teaching the gospel. I could be singing, leading out song service. I could be leading out in church services or, or having family worship. But if I'm doing it for the wrong motive, maybe it's the fear of punishment, or maybe it is the fear of, of the pain, or maybe it is so that I could be seen, so others can see what I'm doing, or whatever it is, that God is looking not just at what we're doing, but why we're doing it. And then all this goodness that we have done could, could be for naught. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus describes how many are going to say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful things? Have we not cast out devils in your names? And then he's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, ye that work iniquities. And that is one of the most solemn and, and uh, it's one of the most solemn ideas or like phrases that I've ever heard Christ say. And I do not want Christ to say to me, depart from me. I never knew you. I want to have such a personal relationship with Christ that He knows me, that, that, that I hear His voice and I follow Him wherever He goes. But it shows that we could be doing a lot of good things, but the behavior is not what we should be focusing on. The behavior will come when the motive is right. And the way that you win the motive is, is by showing the love of Christ, is by showing how God loves us so much that He wants to, us to have a better life. When we really believe that God loves us and He has good plans for us, then we'll cease to worry about the future. We'll cease to have fear. 
First John says, perfect love casts out all fear. So fear is the opposite of love. You, you can't be motivated by fear and motivated by love at the same time. There's two motives that are perpetuating every action we do. So search your heart, friends. And as I started searching my heart, I began to realize, wow, maybe some of the things that I'm doing is as a result of fear. And maybe that's why I haven't been getting lasting change. But when we're motivated by love, everything changes. Like, I, I heard this testimony of this woman. She was married to a drill sergeant. And this drill sergeant, she would, he would tell her everything that he wants and expects of her. And the very specifications had this big list, a checklist, like, I want you to iron my socks. I want breakfast to be on the table at this time. I need this to be done. And he's like, you need to do this, 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 and this, and this. And she just felt like she was under a tyrant. She felt so, like, he was so controlling. And uh, it was like a prison to her. She was miserable in her marriage. And then that drill sergeant, he passed away and died. She ended up remarrying. And she was married to a man who treated her so well, who she loved and she respected, and she enjoyed this second marriage. She was experiencing so much peace. And one day she was up in the attic, and she was going through some old boxes, and she finds this old list. And she's going through it, and the moment she sees the list, she re remembers, she's like, oh... I remember that, that drill sergeant and how he had me do this and that, and he was so particular about his socks and everything that needed to be done. She just had all these emotions that were coming up of resentment, and she's going through the list. She's like, have meals at this time, have the food out here, do, and iron the socks. And she realized, she's going through the list, she's like, wait a second, I'm still doing every single one of these things that are on the list. But this time, I'm doing it with, with joy and with fulfillment and peace. I love doing these things. It's not a drudgery. It's not grievous to me. But the difference was because she loved her current husband. And that is the, the thing. The Epistle of John says, This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous to us. You see, this woman was doing the same thing for both husbands. One, she was afraid and felt forced, and therefore it wasn't really from the heart. The other, she was loved and she was obedient. She, she was so grateful she wanted to give back and did the same thing, different motive. One lived in fear and torments, and the other one lived in just great bliss and peace and joy. That is two classes of people in their experience with God. When we try to serve Him out of fear of, of hellfire, fear of punishment, fear of the seven last plagues, fear of the pain and the consequences that happen as a result of not doing it, when that is our only motivation, we're going to be miserable Christians. We are going to be obeying, but it's really just the leaves of hypocrisy. It's the leaves of, of, of just incongruency where we feel in bondage because our heart's not in the right place. Or another group of Christians that this is the experience I want for you and this is the experience that God wants for us is to that we see that God loves us so much. We want to return back to Him. We are so motivated by His love that with that we want to follow His plan. We know He cares for us, and we know His plans are better than our plans, and they're higher than our plans. As Jeremiah 29, 11, He has thoughts towards us of peace and not of evil. And so we, fought, we obey Him, be, and we change the actions because our heart is softened and subdued. It's one to Christ. And then it's not grievous. This is what God is looking for. And when I realized that, I began to look at behavior totally different. I stopped focusing on the behavior because good acts, good works is not enough. Good works just simply, uh, it, it can be, it's just fruit. It could show, it's a symptom of what's taking place with the heart. This is the work that God is seeking to do in each of our lives. And 
Um, those were the two things that really stood out to me. And the third I'm going to leave you with is if you're really trying to change, something you can do to make a difference is, is to recognize that the way God operates is He doesn't just take something away without replacing it with something better. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12.31 that I'm going to show you a more excellent way. There's something better. I remember this little, um, th this meme that I saw. It was so neat. There was this little girl who was holding on to this teddy bear and she was clinging on it. It was so tight. She's like, no, no. And she didn't want to let go. And then Jesus was over there and he had his hand behind his back and the other one outstretched. And he's like, give me the little teddy bear. And behind his back was this massive teddy bear that he was ready to replace it with. He's like, give it to me. And she was just cleaning on and crying and just like, no, not the teddy bear. She's like, don't take my teddy bear. And it was just a little thing. And little did she know that by giving up what she loved, she can find something that she loved better. And you can remember that God promises in Psalms that he will satisfy thy mouth with good things that God is seeking to give you good. He is trying to give us something better. And if we're trying to overcome evil, Romans chapter 12, verse 21, it describes how we are to overcome evil with good. Don't just take things away, but find some, a substitution. Find something better to replace it with. And when I started to shift that, I began, it, it wasn't enough for me to just quit playing video games because then I'd be like twiddling my thumbs and just wonder what am I going to do with my life? I had to replace it with something that I started watching videos like from Little Light Studios, amazing YouTube channel, great videos where they show the insides of the video games and how they work and why they, it's not a good thing for Christians um, to be engaged in. But as I started to watch, I started to learn, as I started to continue to, um, I, I started to pick up my Bible and to read. That time that I was spent be distracting my mind and drowning it off from my sorrows, I opened the Word of God and acquainted myself with the will of my Maker. And in God's Word, I found a divine Savior that satisfied all of my needs. And that overcoming evil with good changed everything. It wasn't enough to just stop my bad habits and just be idle. I needed to do something. So I found, I, when I sold all my video games, I um, sold them for $700 in four days. I bought a thousand Bible study books and I just started going out door to door to door to door. And I had 1,500 books that I gathered my friends together and church members and said, hey, let's go get these out to our neighbors because they need to hear what great things God has shared with us. And in finding something better to preoccupy my time, engaging in ministry, serving Christ, I found the cure for sin. I found the cure for lasting change. It's in Revelation 12, 11. We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. You see, the secret of overcoming is by helping others overcome. This was profound. So never take something away without replacing it with something better. This is how God operates and this is how God is seeking to change our lives. So the three things again in review was, was number one is work from the inside out. And number two, I realized that we can do the exact same thing but with a different motive. There's two motives that perpetuate everything that we do. And number three is a principle of something better. This is what God has for us. And I just want to encourage all of you to be able to, um, to experience this great change and have lasting change. So you're not feeling like, oh, I made a mistake. I'm stuck. I'm going to be doing this all the time. And you, you can really start seeing a shift and it stays that way. Now, um, if you like this video, I really encourage you to hit like and to share this video with other people because sharing is caring. And I'm going to share with you a, a scripture song, a relevant one on this matter, that's going to help you to remember in your mind 
what to do when you're trying to change, when you're trying to change, work on the heart. Because Proverbs 27.3 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So the heart is the mind. If you want to change the heart, we got to work with the mind and allow God to work in us. So this is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's a beautiful song. I want this to be in your memory, in your mind, every time that you're tempted and you're feeling like you need a change and, and you're wondering how can I be transformed is by the renewing of your minds from the inside out. And if you like this video, go to thearmyofyouth.com because we're going to show you more tactical tips and tangible principles that you can use to find lasting victory, to find lasting change. At the Army of Youth, we love to help people to have their devotions irresistibly interesting. We love to equip people with the tools that they can be soldiers for Christ and to wage a good warfare. And some of the equipment is found on thearmyofyouth.com. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. God bless.